the time? Even when you don't think he is. So I want to tell you about something this week. Um, this week, I had a week with hair on it. Like if I never had this week again in my whole life, I would be totally fine with it. Anybody ever had a week like that? Just raise your hand and say, amen. amen. I so get you. And um, I had the opportunity this week. And doesn't it seem like the enemy comes to fight right when you got an opportunity? And so I had this opportunity this week to do the biggest podcast I had ever done. And I had been fighting and it was to the point where I just wanted to cry. I really couldn't think. And so I thought, you know, this isn't live, um, it's recorded. And this is a friend of mine. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna call him and ask him, hey, is there any way we could do this another time? I get it. It might mean we can't do it for a few weeks or a few months. That's my fault, but at least I'll do a good job. But I thought before I do that, I probably need to check in with my husband. So I went in and I said, hey, hon, I am fighting right now. He's like, girl, you have been through more spiritual warfare in the last couple of weeks than I have ever seen you go through. I'm like, I know. <laughs> and I'm having trouble holding it together. So I think I need to put off this podcast so I do a good job. Because I just feel like I need to cry right now. And he doesn't get up. He doesn't come over. He doesn't give me a hug. He sits in his chair, which Lord help me forgive him for that. <laughs> and um, he kind of leans back in his chair a little bit because it rocks. And he leans back in his chair and he goes, baby. You can totally do that if you want to. I mean, it's only a defining moment in your ministry. Husband said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, you're letting the devil know exactly what it takes to stop you. So if you wanna just put hell on notice, oh, this is Nicole's limit, and if we want her to stop, this is the game we play. You go ahead and you just reschedule, do it when you feel better. How many of you know I want to smack him right about now? <laughs> He's like, or you could put your big girl pants on and go do your job. <laughs> oh yeah, y'all clap. I wanted to cry and hit him at the same time. I'm like, you're a terrible husband in my head. You're a terrible husband. And, you know, I'm just not going to go put on, I'm going to go cancel this thing right now in my head. I'm just like, okay. And I start to walk away and I realize, doggone it, he's right. <laughs> Don't you hate it when your spouse is right? Especially about the big things. So I just marched my little happy butt up there to the podcast, knowing I am about to suck rotten eggs. <laughs> it's gonna be horrible. And I'm like, God, you're gonna have to help me because I can't do this by myself. And God's up in heaven like, that's hilarious. You thought you could do this by yourself. I'm like, God, you're just gonna have to give me the words to say and you're gonna have to get me through this. And they come on and like, hey, how are you? Yeah, we're just talking about you thriving and talk about what happened to you. And how are you so resilient after molestation? Blah, blah, blah. And, how, and I start preaching the word and I start preaching the promises and I start feeling good and I start feeling better than that. And by the time the podcast is over, I'm like, I have not felt this good in like three weeks. What do you know? The word works, the word works. His promises are true. And your feelings are a liar. Your feelings are liar. And this girl is on fire. <laughs> I got done and I was feeling good, y'all. I was feeling good in the hood. And isn't it funny what the word will do every single time? I didn't wanna go preach the word and it turns out as I was preaching to them, I was preaching to me and it was bringing the word of God and strength and breath and life to me on the inside. To the point I was done with that, I'm like, all right, what's next? Let's go, let's go kick some devil butt. And during the podcast, she kept asking me, so tell me, how were you resilient? How were you resilient? How were you resilient? And when she ended the podcast, 30 minutes later, she said, so tell me, how were you resilient? And I kept thinking in my head, I thought I answered that question. So I stopped and I thought, how, how was I resilient? And you know, I didn't have to go back that far. I really only had to go back 30 minutes. <laughs> And I realized resilience 
is a choice. And that's actually the title of my message today. Resilience is a choice. Go ahead and tell somebody, say resilience Resilience. is a choice. And so in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, resilience, it can be based on this chapter. It says, I call heaven and earth to witness to you this day. I have set before you death and I have set before you life. Then he goes on and he's like, you know, I know my kids are smart and all, but this is one test. I can't let them fail. So I need to tell them the answer. This is a multiple choice test. It's only, it's true, false. There's only two answers and I'm going to give them the answer. So he says, I said before you, blessing and life, or blessing and cursing, death and life. Therefore, choose life. So, okay, so he gives us the answer and how many of you have been in situations just like mine with the podcast and somebody wasn't there to tell you to put your big girl pants on and go do your job and you did not choose life, say me, 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 me. Resilience is a choice. And so I I figured these cards were too small. So I went ahead and I brought some bigger cards and so, I want to talk about choosing. So I want somebody to choose. Ella, come here, darling. You're so cute. She's cute. She's single. She's just graduated from high school. She's getting a job. She's got all the things. Isn't she good looking, y'all? She knows the drill. Pick a card, any card. Don't show it to me. Don't show it to me. Don't show it to me. Okay, go ahead. Show it to them. Show it to them. Show it to them. Does everybody see the card? Okay, don't show it to me. Okay, now put it back in here somewhere. Don't let me see where you put the card. Don't let me see where you put the card. Did did you get in there? Okay. And now it is my job. P.S. I've gotten this trick right three times in a row. So I'm feeling pretty confident right about now. Me and the Holy Ghost are just going to pick your card. So I'm just going to say, Holy Ghost, you need to help me pick the right card. What is the card, Lord? (gasps) Okay, I believe. Is this your card? Yeah. Did I get it right? Hey. Oh, hey, hey, look at God. God is really cool. How many of you know Ella did a great job? Here's the thing. When you go to choose in life and we feel like, okay, God's just shuffling my life around. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll just, I'll just pick something. I feel like a blind dog in a meat house. I feel like a mosquito at a nudist colony. I don't know which way to go. I'm just going to pick me something. No, God says, what does he tell us to do? He tells us choose. And we have all these reasons that we don't. I can't, I can't choose that right now because it just hurts too bad. Y'all, y'all, you, do, you don't understand what happened to me. You don't understand my history. You don't know what happened to me. And I mean, you don't know what happened because of me. And I mean, I hurt them so bad and I can't fix it. Y'all ever cried that in the bathroom? I say in the bathroom because for some reason we are sick, miserable people and we like to watch ourselves cry. (laughs) Look how bad this has destroyed me. I look like this right now. Now, I want you to know that that is a trick and a lie of the enemy because the enemy is a joker, y'all. How many of you have dated some of these? How many of y'all have dated too many of these, say I mean? The devil is a joker and he will lie to you and he will try and make a mockery of you. So when you're sitting in the bathroom having a pity party, which always comes with a table for one and there is no other chair because nobody else is going to join you in that place. Trust me, I tried to recruit Pastor David with me when I was going to do the podcast. We have the reasons we can't do it because it just hurts too bad. And here's the sentence you're not going to like, but it's obvious. It's absolutely true. And it is that God is not obligated to heal a hurt that you won't look at. He won't, he's not gonna do it because it's not what his word says. His word says, casting your care on him for he cares for you. So if we don't give it to him, he doesn't have to handle it. And he said, well, well, I've talked to God about it one time and and then, but then it came back up in my head. No, Matthew 7, 7 says, you need to ask. And keep on asking and it will be given to you. But God has no obligation to heal us of a thing that we won't give it. It's our job to give it to him and we can't give it to him if we won't look at it. So we have to look at the hurt. 
And I know it hurts to look at hurts. I know it hurts when your heart gets, gets just torn into shreds. I know it hurts when you fall off a bike. Has anybody got a scar in the house? I have a scar, I'm gonna show you my scar. Um, I'm gonna show it to you, it's on my knee. Try not to lust. I know these are some great looking calves, right? Everybody always looks awkward with like boots or socks pulled up and then like in short, I don't know, that's a whole new style coming. I am gonna rebel and not going. But I have this scar on my knee right here. It's about the size of a quarter. That happened when I was five years old learning how to ride a bike. Took a corner, hit some gravel, ditched my bike, fell, scraped my knee, and I would not go to swimming lessons for two weeks because I was scared that the chlorine was gonna sting my knee and my mom whipped my tail because she wasted the money. And then this one, uh, it's like a three inch scar. I don't even know how that one happened. Um, I was on vacation with Pastor David. We were walking around, I looked down and there was blood going down my leg. I guess something was so sharp, I didn't even feel it. And my calves are obviously so massive because of 55 hard. (laughs) But I can touch these scars all I want. They don't hurt, I got no problem. Not bringing me any flashbacks, not bringing me any triggers, which I'll talk about in a moment. But when you have a scar, it doesn't hurt anymore, but you remember. When God has healed you, it's not that you'll forget what has happened to you. No, we use that as a memorial stone of what he's done. He's like, you know what? I need you to remember the time that you slew the the lion and you lived through it. And I need you to remember the time you slew the bear and you didn't even feel when it cuts you. And he said, I wanna let you know you're going out to face that giant today and feed his flesh to the fowls of the air because I am God and I am with you. I am for you. I have never left you. I have never forsaken you. I didn't put you on the battlefield by yourself and I didn't put you on the battlefield to lose. You're not fighting for the victory. You're fighting from a place of victory. The battle is ours and the victory is ours because God's fighting in that battle with us. Can somebody say amen? So scars. Jesus has the same scars. He goes and he touches his nail pierced hands. And he said, it doesn't hurt me when I touch this but it causes me to remember. And do you know when he touches his scars, he remembers you. And he said, I died with these scars that you might have life and not have eternal death. So he's saying, I gave everything so that you could choose something. So every time that we don't choose life, we say that he went to the cross for nothing, y'all. God really needs us to choose life. Tell your neighbor, choose life. It causes resilience. It causes us to bounce back. So how how do you bounce back? Well, step number one is you step out in faith. You see, um, faith is what I stepped out in when I went to do that podcast because I just knew I was gonna be terrible. I thought I was gonna damage my reputation. I thought she was never gonna invite me back. I thought this is gonna cost me so much. Isn't that funny? The enemy will try and talk to you about what it's gonna cost you. You know, this relationship, you can't afford the hurt at this point in your life and you can't afford to, to risk it on that job and you can't afford to risk it to go out and take your own business because you know, if you lose all this and you probably will because you know you're not smart enough, you're not fast enough, you're not good looking enough, you're the wrong age, you're the wrong height, you're the wrong kind of personality. He will tell you everything you're not. And then God will come back and he'll tell us everything that we are. But we have to choose, everybody say choose. Choose. We have to choose to believe him. What is that? That is stepping out on something you can't see. Our faith doesn't even begin until our ability ends. If you can possibly do it, you're not in faith. And here's the trick. Hebrews 11, six says, without faith, it is impossible possible to please him. So get this, if you're not stepping out on something so big, it takes everything you've got plus what you can't do, you're not even in the will of God. So what are you willing to risk it for the biscuit? The enemy has pushed us down. But it's like that song, you ever heard that song? I think it's in Shrek or something, it goes, I get knocked down, but I get up again. Nothing ever gonna keep me down. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Nothing ever gonna keep me down. I feel like, I know I did a 
leg workout two days ago and I'm just feeling it right now. <laughs> Ooh. It reminds me of a little boy who walked in a classroom. Everybody else was talking before school and he was standing up talking and these three boys came up to him and they were big and they said, you need to sit down. He said, I don't need to sit down. Nobody else is sitting down. And they said, no, we told you to sit down. And he's like, I don't want to sit down. Nobody else is sitting down. Why are you picking on me? You know, the devil will try and pick on you for no good reason. And they said, no, you need to sit down. And the two boys took his shoulders and the third one put his hands on the back. They said, we said, sit down. And he said, and he gave him a look, the same look I gave Pastor David when he told me to do my job. And he said, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I am standing up on the inside. What does that mean? That means the enemy might have it looking on the outside like you are defeated and like he is one, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you will prosper and every tongue will be cut off and shown to be in the wrong. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. If you believe that God is bigger than the devil, could you praise him for one minute? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. So number one, we have to choose to be resilient. We gotta allow God to bounce us like the biggest rubber ball you ever saw. Number two, we gotta step out in faith, believing that he can do the things that we don't believe can happen. And number three, we gotta train your brain to reign. You know what, it's, it's no you know, accident that life was represented by the king because we serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords and by the heart because he is God and God is love. There was no coincidence in that. We gotta think like a king, we gotta think like royalty. And in 2 Corinthians 10, five, it tells us how. It says, casting down arguments in every high thing. So let me ask you a question right now at all campuses. Every high thing, does that mean 50%? I can't hear you. Does it mean 50%? No. Uh, so most things, does that qualify? No. We have to bring how many thoughts? We have to bring, oh. we have to bring all of our thoughts, every thought into captivity. What does that do? Let me give you the science for it because I am a nerd and I love it when science catches up with the Bible. And there's this thing in your brain called neuroplasticity. And what that means is every time you have a thought, there is neurons in your brain. And these neurons with repeated thoughts grow these things that look like roots in your brain. And these roots have the ability to pull on the gray matter of the brain so that the folds of the brain actually change. What am I telling you right now? I am telling you that the invisible things called thoughts can actually change physical things like the brain. So we have to take every thought captive because I wrote a whole chapter in my book, chapter 11. It's called Being Afraid of Long Hair because I talked about triggers. And one of the triggers that happened to me, because triggers happen because our brain is trained wrong. And one of the triggers that happened to me was because of my ex-husband. My ex-husband got addicted to crack cocaine. He became abusive uh, and he would come at me and it was hernia in my seven, broke my ribs, uh, took a moving ceiling fan out of the ceiling while it was moving and threw it at me while it was still wired. Um, he threw me through a door, threw me through a wall. He would pin me down and I would scream, help, help, help. And he would laugh at me, this evil laugh and go, <laughs> nobody's coming. And the game was I had to try and get out of the house as fast as I could, which sometimes took hours. Um, and sometimes I, I limped out. So when David and I were driving down the street and we were dating, and I wanna just press pause on this message and say, make sure you fight with somebody before you marry them. Because chances are in marriage, you're gonna fight, no matter who you're married to. I've been married for 23 years to Pastor David and 20 of them have been happy. <laughs> hey, that's okay. He's been married for 23 years to me and only 17 of his years have been happy. <laughs> you have to know how to conflict with people because you will conflict with people that are close to you. If they live in your house, if they work at your work, if they go to your church, you're eventually gonna have conflict. So you need to know how to fight. Well, the fighting I had done with my ex-husband, I had trained my brain. And we were driving down the street. And how many of you know Pastor David is passionate? 
He's passionate when he is preaching. He is passionate when he is talking. He is passionate when he is ordering pizza. (laughs) Just passionate. So we're in the car. We're having a disagreement. He's kind of loud because he's passionate. I'm kind of loud because I'm me. And we get to a red light and he goes, look. And when his hand flies up and his face goes my direction, I rear up to try and hit him back because I know I can't get out of the car that fast. My brain moves my body before my mind is even cognizant that that's not my ex-husband. We've trained our brain. What am I saying? We have to train our brain to reign. How do we do that? The only way to retrain our mind is to know the promises of God. Romans 12 and two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How do we get transformed? We get transformed by the renewing of our mind. What does that mean? That means you, my friend, are not a car. Because we try to treat our broken heart, broken life, broken body, broken mind, broken relationship. We try to treat it like a broken car. And then we take the car to the mechanic and we're like, hey, I need you to fix the thingy. And then the mechanic comes in and says, hey, I changed the spark plug and then we replaced your, there's something with a T, transmission. I obviously don't take care of our cars. You know, we're going to give you a new distributor cap and a transmission and you're good to go. Clap, clap, and you're on your way. And you're like, I went to church one time. They preached a message. I feel better. They fixed me. I have graduated. (laughs) No, we are not cars, we take maintenance. It's not a destination, it's a journey towards Christ. And as we diligently seek him, he is right there for us. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So that is why you come to church week after week. That is why you join a small group. That is why you get up in the morning and you say, hi God, it's me again. And I have some more junk to give to you because I need you to maintain me and fill up my wiper fluid and put some gas in me and rotate my tires and straighten out my alignment in Jesus name. I'm really excited, I didn't practice that, and I do know a couple things about a car. I think we just found out what I'm in charge of. So how do you get stronger? Number one, you make a choice. Number two, you step by faith. Number three, you gotta retrain your brain to reign. And number four, you gotta get strong. How do you get strong? It's a presence thing. You gotta get close to him, you gotta get by him. It says in Ephesians 6.10, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong, in the Lord and the power of his might. Y'all, I did not have the wherewithal to pull that podcast off. It was not my strength that got me through it. When the devil pushed me down, I w- my flesh was weak. I was ready to cry. But when we are weak, then he is strong. So when we're on the floor ready to collapse, we just say, Jesus, you are the glory and you are the lifter of my head. I need you to just go ahead and lift me up when I am down because I can't do it all by myself. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says that they that wait upon the Lord. What are you doing right now? You're coming to church, you're waiting upon the Lord. You qualify. What are you doing when you're in a small group? You're coming, you're waiting upon the Lord. You qualify. What are you doing when you're praying in the morning, talking to him, reading your devotional? You qualify. But they that wait upon the Lord, well, I qualified, what did I qualify for? Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not grow weary. They shall run and not faint. What is he telling you? He says, I am Ephesians 3.20. I am exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine. And when you take your plug and you plug it into my power source, I can make you go better, better than electricity, can make a Tesla go 400 miles. That's all right, I'll give you another chance. It's not that problems stop coming and it's that we develop strength. Like Macaulay Culkin, you remember that movie when he goes, I'm not afraid anymore. Home Alone? You can look at life and go, I'm not afraid anymore. When fear knocks at the door, faith is gonna answer it. When the enemy comes to knock you down, you'll say, hey, you know what? I remember, I remember 
just like those scars when I slew the lion. And I can look at another scar and go, I remember when I slew the bear. And I see you coming at me, giant, but I'm here to tell you, I remember what God did for me before, and he's the God that's gonna do it again. And today I am gonna feed your flesh to the fowls of the air. I'm not gonna let the enemy have this one. You look bigger than me, but don't look at me. You need to look at my God. He is life, he is liberty, and he is freedom. doesn't make it go away. Life might give you bad news, but you still have a good report. And as I come back to these cards, I was pretty competent in this card trick because I knew something about this card trick that you didn't. And you know what that was? (laughs) That the deck is stacked in your favor. You can get shuffled and the deck is still stacked in your favor. Life might get crazy and the deck is still stacked in your favor. You might look around and you're still the God of love, the God of mercy, the God of grace, the God of forgiveness, God your provider, God your healer, God your banner here, God God your restorer, God your redeemer, God your El Shaddai, God your Adonai, God, God with us. I tell you what, it's all here. Somebody ever looked at you and said, your pastor preached with a deck of cards. You're like, you just don't understand. (laughs) And this is what I wanna share with you before we close. I wanna share with you that there is some science that finally lines up with the word of God. And whoa, that was fun. (laughs) And I didn't understand about resilience until I really started studying on it this week. And when I studied on it, I found out that there is this thing called post traumatic, and everybody wants to say stress syndrome, right? Because that's all I'd heard of before now. But there's this thing called post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth happens in 10% of the people. And I was like, oh, that's a tithe. I'm a tither. I don't think it's a coincidence. And what post-traumatic growth does is it says it deepens your spiritual life. It helps you see the positive things. It gives you a new appreciation for life and it's a vision of new possibilities and positive change. And so I kept reading and I kept researching and then I saw on Wikipedia, go ahead and put that on from Wikipedia. It says traditional psychology equivalent to thriving is resilience. I'm like, wait, equivalent to thriving? I just wrote the book, I Will Thrive. And I didn't know I was preaching on resilience till this podcast and I didn't know the two went together until right now. So it goes on to say, reaching a previous level of functioning before a stress, trauma, or challenge is resilience. Thriving is a recovery point. Thriving goes above and beyond resilience and it finds the benefits with the challenges. What is that saying? In the natural, when you start trusting God, you can be resilient. And when you choose life, you can bounce and go back to where you were before. But when you really trust God and when you really lean into Him and the devil throws you a bounce, you're not going back to where you were before. You're gonna go so much further, so much farther, so much faster than you were in the first place. Because what the devil meant for evil, God is gonna use for good. He's turning your reverse for promotion. He's making your tombstone your stepping stone. Because when you are free.